You know, he's <laughs> the one with the shirt unbuttoned and stuff like that, trying to trying to look like 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 Mr. Sexy and all of that stuff. So I thought that's why I thought I'd rock this look today yeah, just yeah. for him. The one and only Lewis Riddick is here with yours truly. What's going on, Big Time? How are you, man? I'm I'm doing great. As you see, I got the turtleneck on, zipped all the way up to the top, because you know I, I ain't you. letting you I ain't letting you go ahead and making jokes about me. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Listen, I remember every time I think about the subject of Patrick Mahomes, I think about mm. the guy that um, I spoke to, which was you, before this guy was even drafted. He came into mm. the draft and you was talking about how special this kid was and how he was going to be. And you couldn't understand how so many other people weren't seeing it. I remember the Chicago Bears having the number two overall pick moving up in the draft and passing on him and Deshaun Watson for crying out loud. We reflect on that, and, we're, and yet last night we saw Super Bowl 58, Patrick Mahomes win his third Super Bowl title, his third Super Bowl MVP. Your thoughts as you reflect on this kid and, and, and what we're witnessing before our very eyes at the age of 28. I think it goes all the way back, Stephen A., to that draft when Brett Veach, the current general manager, he wasn't the general manager yet, but he had gone and scouted Patrick numerous times and went back to Andy Reid and went back to the scouting department and said, look, I'm putting all my chips in. I'm putting it all on the table. He will take us to another level that Alex Smith can't take us to. Mm. He has that stuff that you can't coach, the kind of things that in games like we just saw last night, he will just take over and make enough plays in order to win the game. And, they, and remember, Alex Smith that year when Patrick got drafted, Alex Smith had an, a Pro Bowl year. He went to the Pro Bowl, had his best year as a professional. Right. They told me that spring after they drafted him, they knew right away in the first OTA minicamp, they had to pull themselves back and say, do we need to put him in here right now? Or should we continue to wait? There were numerous times during the course of the year where they felt, felt as though they should put him in the game for Alex Smith because they thought he was ready then, but they waited. And the fact that they waited and then he came out his first year as a starter and won the MVP and just went ballistic and took the league by storm, it's been up and up and up parabolic since then. Since then. And so last night, when you see basically for two and a half quarters, man, he was struggling. Yeah. The offense was struggling, doing nothing. Right. But what wound up happening was since San Francisco wouldn't put them away, he was like, you know what, eventually I'm going to figure this out. Defense, just keep me in there and I'll figure it out. I'll make enough plays to Travis Kelsey. I'll make enough plays on fourth and one on an RPO and I'll do it myself. I'll make enough plays in overtime where I'm going to scramble when they go man coverage and I'm going to darn near score myself. And then I'm going to wind up calling a play the same way that we beat Philadelphia a year ago. I'm going to use the same play and I'm going to beat you, San Francisco. I'm going to beat you and I'm going to put the ball to a guy who we had sent away from here yeah. and then brought him back in McCall Hart. He has that thing, again, that's uncoachable. And, but then when you put it with one of the greatest coaches of all time, it kind of it's a force multiplier, Stephen A, for them both. It makes Andy a better coach. It makes Patrick a better player. Andy told me at practice last week, he said, look, the number one thing Patrick can do is he can come off the field and tell me what all 21 guys outside of himself were doing. Right. And that makes it easier for me. I can go ahead then and make all the adjustments in the world and say, and send him back out there and just let him go. So really what he's saying is this. He's got the mind of the greats of all time like Tom Brady, but he's got skill that is infinitely more than what they are. So as long as everything else around him stays competent, he's going to be able to raise the level of everyone else. And there's no question he will be on the chase from now until his career is over to surpass Tom Brady in terms of winning, not in terms of individual mm -hmm. accomplishment. He's already done that. But in terms of win, how does a multitude of teams miss out on somebody whose talent so far exceeds so many? Because remember, it would be one thing if Patrick Mahomes was sat on a bench like Jordan Love did for three years, comes in, plays as well as Jordan Love played this year, even though he had his ups and downs, play as well as Jordan Love played this year. And somebody missed out on that. But if the Kansas City Chiefs, had to restrain themselves from throwing him in immediately because the mm -hmm. first day of OTAs, they saw what his capability of. How do you explain the fact that nine of 10 teams passed up on him and didn't spot that level of talent? How does that happen in an NFL draft? I'll, I'll tell you how. Because, you know, with the 32 teams, man, we could have 32 representatives from each team watch the same guy simultaneously. And you'll have 32 different opinions. Mm. Because it's so subjective when you're just watching the tape. And remember now, at, pa at Texas Tech, Patrick, man, there were many times where you're sitting there going, what is this guy doing? 
it wasn't always clean. It wasn't always pretty. I mean, there were some there were some throws where where he made like the throw he made to McColl last night that got called back. Or rather, no, it was the play that Tayshawn Gibson should have intercepted, where he okay. threw he rolled left and threw it all the way across the field. And there were plays like that at Texas Tech. There were also plays like the interception he threw last night on the force trying to force it to Travis Kelsey. Yeah. So there were there were people Overthrown. going. Yeah, there's people going. Look, he's super talented. But we don't know if we have the structure in order to pull more of the good out of him or whether or not the bad is going to surface. Mm. So what happens is he starts to slide. But Andy trusts Brett. Brett tells him, look, in our structure, with Alex Smith here and the way you coach, we think we can eliminate more of the bad, a lot of the bad, and bring out more of the good because the fact of the matter is his upside far exceeds everyone else's. Mm. And he has it up here. So what you do is you take a calculated risk. And a lot of times, look, I, I can't tell you that if he went to 31 other teams, Stephen A., that he'd be the same guy. Okay. He can't tell you that either. Mm-hmm. What, what, what he can tell you, though, is this. I have a relationship with Andy Reid that is on the level of Belichick Brady, that's on the level of Steve Young, Holmgren, Montana, Holmgren. It's that kind of thing. And Patrick will tell you himself. Look, I just saw a quote where he said this the other day, where I, and, I, and I've seen this before, where he said, I didn't even think I was going to play football. I thought I was going to be a baseball player. I didn't realize I'd be this good at football. Mm. And the fact that he didn't quite know, but he knew he's super talented. Brett Veach didn't know for sure whether or not they'd be able to pull it out of him, but he believed that Andy could. And then going to a place where he can sit and look, you cannot underestimate the power of having a guy like Alex Smith in your quarterback room and what he learned from him. Right. He learned how to be a pro because it ain't just about the flash plays, man. It's about the process. It's a, you know you spend time with Nick. You yeah. know how Nick talked about that down at Alabama. No, no question. It isn't about the end result. It's about the work, being dedicated, married, um, sadistic with the work, and that's what Patrick had become because of him being around Alex Smith, and then being with Andy, and then being with Eric Bieniemy, who held him accountable down there. Let's not let's not discount that either. That's right. And then they get him. Then they have Travis Kelsey. They get Tyreek Hill. Mm. They get the offensive line build up. This I mean, and it's just it's just compounds. Well, let me go to Super Bowl Fifty Eight last night, more specifically, and ask you if there was a defining moment that that I mean, outside of the winning play itself, that yeah. made you believe what ended up happening was inevitably going to happen. What was it? Because I got to admit, I was very very worried. In the first half, sure. when I saw and I said to myself, "What is wrong with Andy Reid? He doesn't seem to be himself." How yeah. the hell has Travis Kelsey got one target for one reception yep. for one yard in an entire first half? This is one of the greatest tight ends in the history of football, and all mm-hmm. time all pro. What, what the hell is going on here? I, I didn't know what was going on. What stood out in your mind? I think where look when they when San Fran had been stoned in Kansas City all night. They force a punt, I believe it's in the third quarter. And obviously the ball touches one of the players on the punt return team. They get the ball deep in San Francisco territory. The next play, he hits MVS on that little switch route. Right there, it woke up the team. Yep. Because they were sleepwalking. Look, San Fran was dealing with them. Rushing the passer, slamming the run. The secondary was playing good. But after that, Patrick started going. Then he started going. And then when they drove the ball down the field and tied the score up before it went into overtime. There was a there was a long 22-yard gain, I believe it was, to Travis Kelsey, mm-hmm. where Kelsey comes all the way across the field. They had him double team, and they still blew it. And the thing about Patrick was when I'm sitting there watching, I was watching the tape this morning, I'm going, you know what? He wasn't perfect in this game at all. But if you give him, give him enough in terms of making mistakes, he's going to capitalize on it. He's going to find it eventually. You can't let him hang around. And then that fourth and one in overtime, people, where they call timeout, they come out of there. And people, and I remember we were in the booth going, they got to run it. They're going to give it to Pacheco. They're going to give it to someone. But she yeah. writes out of the backfield. I said, man, you're crazy. They're going to put Patrick in the gun, and they're going to run something with him out on the edge and let him figure it out. This is a half a billion dollar quarterback. Yeah. And when they put him in the gun and he ran that RPO and picked up the first down, I was like, that's it. There it is. He's going to figure out a way to get this ball down here and score. And that's exactly what it, that was the play where on fourth down, most people were probably screaming and he's going to mess this up. He's going to try and put him in gun. They ain't going to be able to pick up the first down. And he said, you know what? I'm going to ride the guy who has changed the game at this position. And Patrick figured it out. We can't say the same for Brock Purdy, 
who did not play a bad game, who yeah. was far from awful, but his crime was that against Patrick Mahomes, you needed to measure up. Mm -hmm. And when he counted, Patrick Mahomes stood taller than anybody else on the football field. What do mm -hmm. we make of Brock Purdy in San Francisco's performance in the aftermath of this loss? Well, I'll tell you what. There, there's no question. Coming out in the second half, they think they went three straight three and outs. Yes. Couldn't move the ball. They weren't running it. They kept trying to throw it. Yeah, Brock first down for a quarter. Right. But what, what wound up happening was he wound up getting them in a position to win the football game, okay, where he didn't have the ball less. Now, I will say this. In that overtime drive where they had to settle for the field goal, they had bad, bad miscommunication on the offensive line where they turned Chris Jones scot free. Yep. Scott Free, he has two guys wide open. He has Jawan Jennings wide open. He has Brandon Ayuk wide didn't open. Didn't have time to get it to him. And, do, and couldn't get it to him, exactly. So I'm sitting there going, and I know the boy, I know he's going to make them throws. He was making them all night. But they turn loose their best defensive player. So therefore, they have to kick the field goal, and then they can't get off the field in overtime. They can't get off the field. So what I sat there and I thought was this Is this really about Brock not measuring up? Is it about breakdowns around him? There's enough blame to go around for San Francisco. I just said earlier today, they're going to be haunted by this game forever. They should have won that game. Mm -hmm. They should have won that game. And I'm not going to sit here and say Brock didn't measure up to Patrick, but I will say this. Patrick figured out a way to win it in crunch time, aided by the fact that San Francisco played good for about 90% of that game good enough to win it. Mm -hmm. And in crunch time, they folded. They folded and you well, listen. You couldn't get Kansas back. City. You couldn't get. You couldn't keep Kansas City off the field because all you needed was a first down. You get a yeah. first down, you run out the clock. You San Francisco. You win the Super Bowl championship. They couldn't do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, in overtime, you see. Look. Okay. So let, let's put it this way. In overtime, why did Kyle take the ball first? Right. I was. That was how my next did, question. How are the players talking about now? They didn't know the rules in overtime. They didn't know the rules. How is that? Why wouldn't you give it to Patrick first and make them have to score a touchdown? And then you have the choice to then go back and say, hey, look, now not only can we score, do we need to score? Two-point conversion. And the two-point conversion. We know exactly what we need to do. Right. Why wouldn't you do that? I mean, those I are the kind of things. I thought the only explanation, Lewis, was that they were gassed at the end of regulation because they wanted to feel for so long. The defense, and that, right. And that he thought that there was no way they'd be able to stop them right. because they That's were gassed in overtime. That's the only thing I can think of. That's possible, and I said that in the booth. But for his players to come out and say, look, we never really even discussed this and went over this. Wow. We didn't even know. And then you have Chris Jones talking about the fact that we've been repping this since training camp. Right. This perfect scenario. Man, I'm telling you what. There are going to be some sleepless nights out there in Santa Clara for a long time because mm. this was a total meltdown. They should have won that game, man. But you know what? Should have, could have, would have, whatever you want to call it. You let Patrick have enough time to figure it out. You let Andy have enough time to figure it out. You let Spags have enough time to figure out what's your pressure point to where I can make you break and not be able to make a play. This is what's going to happen. You're going to lose to these guys. You got Hall of Fame people on this mm -hmm. team. Hall of Fame coach, Hall of Fame quarterback, Hall of Fame tight end, who made big plays when they needed him to. The result is what it is. So now what do we say about Kyle Shanahan? Three straight NFC titles. Bro, I don't title know. Games, four title games, four NFC title games in the last five years, two Super Bowl appearances, no Super Bowl championship as a coach. And oh, by the way, when he was the offensive coordinator in Atlanta, they had a 28 to 3, 20 to 3 lead. Yep. They lost that to Tom Brady and the New England Patriots, in part because they didn't run the football. They should yep. they, they they kept throwing it, which means with an incomplete pass, stopping the clock and giving Brady and New England time to come back on you. Mm -hmm. Then he's the head coach in Kansas in, in San Francisco. They've got a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter against the San Francisco. I'm uh, sorry, against the Kansas City Chiefs. Yep. They blew that. They yep. have a 10-point lead in this game. Yep. And they blow that. What yeah. are we to make of Kyle Shanahan in light of those realities combined yeah. with what you just finished saying about the sleepless nights that are yeah. going to obviously be provoked because of the outcome of this game? Hey, man, what I say is this. Brilliant play caller, play designer. That's a great way of really jiving with his players, pulling out the best of them. But as far as being a game day, in the moment tactician, all the things that, used to be, that people used to beat Andy Reid down for, He's kind of showing some of them cracks now. Mm.
and he's gonna have to learn from him. now. The question is, well, people are gonna say, well, how long do you let him continue to have, continue to like learn on the job? Well, I mean, he's gotten his teams to two Super Bowls. He's had ten point leads in both Super Bowls as head coaches. I mean, you gonna fire him? No, you ain't gonna fire him. But he's gonna be one of those people who you're gonna constantly go, is he good enough to get him over the hump with his, you know, with his strategizing in the in the moment? We don't know. So far, he's not. Now, I can tell you this. I know he didn't coach uh, Colton McKibbitts, the right tackle, to turn loose Chris Jones on third right. down. And over the, I know he ain't coaching that. Mm-hmm. He, ain't co- he, he ain't coached the guy in special teams to get the ball knocked off his, exactly. foot, his back of the foot. Exactly. Or, or McLeod to not just drop on the football exactly. and, and cover it instead of trying to pick it up and run with it. Exactly. He's not coaching that kind of stuff. But you know what? In the end, that stuff all filters up to the head coach, and he's going to be the one who has to answer for it because ultimately he's in charge. And really, that's all, that's all we care about are the end results. If the 49ers had won this game, I had Christian McCaffrey as the MVP. Would I have been wrong as opposed to Brock Purdy? Would I have been wrong? If Brock had thrown a touchdown in overtime and say they win it, so you say, say they somehow are able to get um, Kansas City off the field, he had hit either Ayuk or Jennings there, I think he's going to I think he's going to get it. I think he's going to get it in that moment because the ball was in his hands. He made the decision, and he put it on the right spot. Because he made some money throws now. He mm-hmm. made some money throws. But at the same time, there were some times there, the three straight drives starting in the third quarter where he couldn't get anything going. Spags had him had, and had their pressure packages dialed up. But I think simply because the ball would have been in his hands in the last moments of the game and it would have been the deciding points, I think he would have got it. Just a couple more questions before I let you get on out of here. Lewis Riddick right here with Stephen A. Smith. I got to ask you this. When I look at Kansas City, and yeah. I said this on numerous occasions over the last week, although I picked Kansas City to win, and I'm not surprised at all that Patrick Mahomes is the MVP, mm-hmm. I said to myself it would actually be better for the game of football if San Francisco won. Yeah. Because there's somebody to knock off Kansas City. Mm-hmm. We see, we know they lost to Brady a couple of years ago in Tampa Bay when he had no offensive line. He was running mm-hmm. for his life. He spent Super Bowl running for his life. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, obviously, it's three Super Bowl titles in five years. We know what Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and the crew bring to the table. I said, if San Francisco beats them, then you've got somebody in Purdy with Debo, with Christian McCaffrey, with Kyle Shanahan that obviously slayed the dragon. Yeah. If you don't have that, where do you go from here? They're young, Kansas City I'm talking about. They're young, they're physical defensively. They've got athletes. They put a hat on you. Mm-hmm. They're exceptionally well coached by Steve Spagnuolo. And mm-hmm. then on the offensive side of the ball, they spent the lead, the season leading the league in drop passes. And you still end up winning the Super, the Super Bowl championship without a Tyreek Hill, without yeah. the luxury of a guy that, that, that helped you win the Super Bowl before, or somebody literally like DeAndre Hopkins or somebody else. You don't have those dudes, and you still win the Super Bowl. What hope is there for the National Football League? I know it's parity. I know that it's competitive. Any given Sunday mm-hmm. injuries can happen. But all things being equal in terms of health. Yeah. What hope is there that somebody's going to knock off Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey and these boys the way they're looking? Yeah, it's going it's to come down to, look, the thing that will give other teams a lot of hope is if, one, if Andy were to retire and or leave in the next two, three years, I don't think two, something, that. God forbid, I don't even want to say, but somehow 15 ain't on the field. Right. But otherwise... Brett Veach and Andy Reid are like this when it comes to understanding what the team needs, the kind of players that they want and what they can ultimately get out of them. So that that's not going to change for the foreseeable future. What you hope is that, you know, what the, what the hope has to be is in the most crucial moments, it's not about necessarily physical skill against Patrick. It's about not committing the dumb mistakes that allow him time to figure stuff out because you're going to figure it out. You have to beat him more so with smart football than by – necessarily being you know great athletes okay because right. look new england beat him because guess i mean look what happened new england didn't make mistakes like let's, let's say go, go back to his afc title game where tom brady beat him when frank clark jumps off sides right right you have to hope almost that you like you play smart football and let them make the mistakes let them beat themselves but you can't commit dumb penalties you can't commit errors like you have in terms of touching the football and punt return team and giving them the ball in plus you know in plus mm-hmm. territory. You can't do that. So right. that's your hope. You better get you better get with it up here even more so than on the field. Because San Francisco, man for man, one through fifty three, most football people will tell you, you don't have to be a football person. That's a more talented team. They would tell you that. 
they told they would tell you that Baltimore was a team that they were like, man, this is going to be a war now. Right. We don't know how we're going to come up out of this. But you know what gave them hope? The fact that Andy is there and Pat is there. So as long as you have those two, you always are going to put doubt into the opponent's eyes, no matter how good they are. Who do you, who do you give the best chance to to knock them off in both the AFC and the entire league? Ah. Uh, you know what? There's one cat in the entire league who mentally can compete on par with Patrick and can raise the level of the people around him the same way Patrick can. And who is and that's that? That's Joe Burrow. Yeah. That's Joe Burrow. That's the only guy for me. The yeah. only guy. And he has proven. See, Joe Burrow. Because he beat just him. Like Pat, just like Patrick is in everyone else's head, Joe Burrow was in Kansas City's head. Yeah. Okay? That's a fact. He was since he was driving this team crazy now, and when he comes back, he's really the one guy right now that is there with him. That is there with him because he's since he, since he's going to be a problem. Since he's going to be a problem, anybody yep. in the NFC? Because right now, I mean, I looked at San Francisco the way they played defense yesterday, but I said to myself, you know something? Let me look at the rest. I mean, if Detroit ran the ball more in the second half, San Francisco ain't even there. Yeah, that's I'm true. Matthew Stafford. I'm I'm not willing to tell you that Brock Purdy is better than Matthew Stafford and right, Puka Nakua. Right. I right. mean, and and the stud that he's proven to be just as a rookie. I yeah. mean, I, I think the the Rams have a tremendous upside. I'm wondering about teams in the NFC. Anybody in the NFC? Oh yeah, yeah. Mind? Look, 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 Detroit. Detroit will take another leg up. They will. Detroit's going to be there for a while now, and don't count San Francisco out because mm-hmm. Purdy. Look. Purdy came back from an injury that no other quarterback has ever come from as a second-year Mr. Irrelevant guy. Right. You think he's not going to continue to get better? He hasn't plateaued. He's going to get better. Mm. Sam Fran will continue to be there. John Lynch and them are too good as far as finding players. Detroit is going to be there. And the Rams, look, I was texting with Sean McVay the other day. He was like, man, this is killing me not being in this game. Right. And you know they're going to be exceptionally well coached too. So, yeah, there's, there's a couple teams in it in the NFC. There's a couple teams in it in the AFC, but Joe Burrow, it's not like they're in it. They're right there. Mm. They're right there with, with, with KC, and they can beat them at any. That's the only team that I feel as though that quarterback is saying, hey, yo, for what you do, I can do. For what you do, I can do. And I'll tell you who Kansas City fears. Kansas City fears Buffalo. I was getting ready to bring up Josh. Kansas Hammond City fears Buffalo. Buffalo because they say, even the people down there will tell you that Josh Allen scares them, man. They know that they cannot – like Patrick has to raise it like to another, another level because of what Josh Allen can do. Well, my last question to you is you didn't say the league MVP, Lamar Jackson. You know what? I th- I'm talking about like right now – okay, so – and you know I love Lamar. Yeah. Okay? I'm wondering – look, here, here's the next level for Lamar, right? The next level for Lamar, and he's taking his game up levels every year. Yeah. The next level now is for him and Todd Munkin to be on the same page to where they don't have the kind of like brain lapses like they had against Kansas City where they start forgetting who they are. Right. That Lamar starts forgetting who he is. Like Todd Munkin got to tell him, Lamar, in the middle of this game, Lamar, you got to go. You got to go now. We can't be holding it in the pocket. And he got to tell Todd Munkin, hey, look, we got to run the rock here. What are you doing? Why are we, why are we dropping me back, keeping me in the pocket? Because Patrick will tell – Andy that. Mm. And Joe Burrow will tell the coaches in Cincinnati that. That's the next level for him. Mm-hmm. Because you got to be at that level in order to match what ultimately Kansas City can do, even when it ain't going good for him. Appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much, Lewis Riddick. Always appreciate your greatness, man. Have a great, great offseason. I don't think you have an offseason, though. I no, mean, bro. It's, it's, it's draft football. time. It's draft, it's draft time, time, right? Yeah, we, right. I, I got to have you on the draft. One of these days, I'm going to interrupt you on the draft. Just that, you know, I'm going to roll up there. I'm going to have to make sure I got a collar shirt, but three buttons are going to be you need. You know what? You need to do that this year my, in Detroit. With my big, sexy look. That's what I'm going to do, man. I'm Come gonna up do there it. in Detroit. Do that. It's going to be in Detroit this year. It's in Detroit. Wow. Wow. Then, see, that's why people wanted them to go ahead and make it to the Super Bowl. That well, city's going to be crazy for the draft. It, it's going to be crazy for the draft, and finally they're relevant again. I'm happy for that city. I really, really am because Absolutely. I think Dan Campbell did a hell of a job, and Jared Goff proved himself to be a real yes, quality indeed. football coach, and I love Gibbs and Montgomery running the football. They got some weapons in Detroit. I don't know what the hell happened to them. Hey, Jameer Gibbs, 
Hey, let's just go on the record and say it now. I said it a couple a couple weeks ago, about a month ago. Jameer Gibbs will be a front runner for MVP next year if they give him the rock more. He's the most electric player in the league right now, regardless of position. Right. You see the speed. You see what he can do. Yeah. That kid is for real. He's going to burst onto the scene a la Marshall Falk type stuff yep. next year. Watch. You got to keep Montgomery there with him to protect him from being right. overloaded. You got to do right. that. See, I right. learned a little something from you, man. I learned a little yeah. something from you. I see, I, I, know that, I ain't know that until I started talking to Lewis. No, I ain't no, know. You, you know, ball. You know how it goes. <laughs> you know Appreciate how it goes. you. Love you, bro. Of Thank course, you so much for your time, bro. Appreciate of you. Of course. Bro.